A thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us, all who will believe, will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And sing, Your name is the highest. Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above them all. And all thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name, it stands above them all, and the angels cry, holy, all creation cries, holy, you will If you've been redeemed, sing the song forever to the Lamb. Oh, if you walk in freedom, and if you bear His name, sing the song forever to the Lamb. We'll sing the song forever and amen. Sing your name. Cause your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above them all, above all thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all, and the angels cry. creation cries holy you will lift it high holy holy forever hear your people sing holy to the king of kings holy you will always be holy holy forever cause your name is the highest your name is the greatest your name stands above them all Above all thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all. Sing your name. Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above them all. Above all thrones and dominions all powers and positions your name stands above them all and the angels cry holy all creation cry holy you will lift it high
If my heart could tell a story If my life would sing a song If I have a testimony If I have anything at all There's been no one like the Lord No one ever cared for me like Jesus His faithful hand has held me all this way And when I'm old and gray and all my days are not put on the earth let it be known that in you alone my joy was found. Oh, I found, I found my joy. Let my children tell the children. Let this be their memory. That all my treasure was in heaven And you were everything to me And no one ever cared No one ever cared for me like Jesus His faithful hand has held me all this way Yes, it has and when I'm old and gray and all my days are not put on the earth, let it be known that in you alone my joy was found. Oh, I found, I found my joy. I'm still in love You're still enough for me Still all I want You're still my everything I'm still in You're still enough for me Still all I want You're still my everything There's no one ever cared for me like Jesus Oh, His faithful hand is held me all this way and when i'm old and gray all my days are not put on the earth let it be known that in you alone my joy was found For the Spirit of the Lord is there is freedom. Amen. So Holy Spirit, we pray as we enter into this next, next song that you would fall afresh on us. We don't want to move if you're not leading the way, Lord. We don't want to move if you're not there. So we're asking that you would pour your Spirit out. Pour your Spirit out. As we wait on you, Jesus, pour your spirit out. Spirit sound, rushing wind, fire of God fall within. Holy Ghost, breathe on us, we pray. As we repent, 
Turn from sin, revival, ember, smoldering, breath of God, fan us into flame. Cause we need a fresh wind, the fragrance of heaven. Pour your spirit out, pour your spirit out. Mm. Spirit of for hearts, for hearts that burn with holy fear, purified in faith and deed, refiners fire, strengthen what remains. So we the church who bear your light, lamp of flame, city bright. King and kingdom come is what we pray. We need a fresh wind, the fragrance of heaven. Pour your spirit out, pour your spirit out. It's a holy anointing and the power of your presence. Pour your spirit out. Pour your spirit out, 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 pour your spirit out. For your spirit out. Let all the redeemed prophesy and sing. We can hear the wind blowing, blowing, blowing. Move upon our praise. Sons and daughters sing. We can hear the wind. Cause we need a fresh wind, the fragrance of heaven. Pour your spirit out, pour your spirit out. A holy anointing and the power of your presence. Pour your spirit out, pour your spirit out. Pour your spirit out. Pour your spirit out. Mm -hmm. Pour your spirit out. Oh, Christ be magnified. Let his praise arise, Christ be magnified in me, singing, oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life, Christ be magnified in me, yeah. amen. Let's all sing this song together, we're creation suddenly. Were creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry? Then from north to south and east to west, we'd hear Christ be magnified or the whole earth. Were the whole earth echoing his imminence, his name would burst from sea and sky, and from rivers to the mountain tops, we'd hear Christ be mad. 
magnified. Let's lift up just the voices and sing, oh Christ be magnified. Singing, oh Christ be magnified. Let his praise arise. Christ be magnified in me. Oh Christ be magnified from the altar of my be magnified in me. Yeah. When every creature, when every creature finds its inmost melody, in every human heart its native cry, oh, then in one in raptured him. We'll sing, Christ be magnified, lift him high. We're singing, oh, Christ be magnified, let his praise arise, Christ be magnified in me. of my life Christ be magnified in me be magnified in me Lord we believe help our Let's sing this together in faith. I won't bow to idols. No, I won't bow to idols. I'll stand strong and worship you. And if it puts me in the fire, I'll rejoice because you're there too. I won't be formed by feelings. I hold fast to what is true. Because if the cross brings transformation, I'll be crucified with you, yeah. Because death is just a doorway into resurrection life. And if I join you in your sufferings, then I'll join you when you rise. And when you return in glory with all the angels and the saints, my heart will still be singing and my song will be the same. Oh, Christ be magnified. Let his praise arise. Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life. Christ be magnified in me. Thank you, Jesus. Be magnified in me. Now this last song we're gonna sing is called Tend. And it's all about how the Lord, our creator, is faithful and gentle as he tends to us, his children. And we know that that we're gonna learn in, in our lesson today that in every season of our life, the highs and the lows, the Lord is able to nurture us with compassion and in wisdom, right? Now in John chapter 15, the Lord is likened to a vine dresser and he's a vine dresser who cuts back and prunes parts of the vine that shouldn't be there. We know that the Lord doesn't rush, that he's always on time. And when we are in Christ, we trust him to make something beautiful out of us. Amen. He's going to make something beautiful out of us. He already is making something beautiful out of us. So during this song, I just invite you to whatever posture you want to take before the Lord, 
Just sit with Jesus and rest in him. Thank you, Lord. In the landscape of my life, you don't rush through any season. You always take your time. A careful hand, a gentle guide. You take what's dead away, and you prune what's running wild. So be the gardener of my heart, tend the soil of my soul, break up the fallow ground, cut back the overgrown, and I won't shy away, I will let the branches fall, so what you want can stay. What you love can grow. Through the winter, I'm still alive. Here we are. What you planted in the dirt is ever reaching to the light. You prepare me for dark and time. You sustain what you have started, and you'll teach me to abide. So be the gardener of my heart, tend the soil of my soul. Break up my fallow ground, cut back the overgrown, and I won't shy away. I will let the branches fall. So what you want can stay, and what you love can grow. And what you love can grow. Thank you, Sarah. That was absolutely beautiful. Thank you. Now, for just a quick announcement, I'm going to announce our guest speaker this morning. My good friend Lori Warning is here from Crossway Church of Menifee. We've been friends for many years. Um, she's just a wonderful person. I'm not going to hinder what God is doing right now. So, Lori, if you'll come up and I'll pray with you and we will get started. Heavenly Father, I lift up my sister right now to you, Lord. I ask you just to remove her and fill her with you, O oh Lord. Just give her your words for your daughters this morning. Just bless our time. Open our ears to receive what you have for us, Lord. Go before us. And we thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Well, good morning. Hasn't this been magnificent? Oh, I mean, we had all that yummy food, all these beautiful decorations. We had this wonderful worship, and now we get to get into the Word of God. And I'll tell you, okay, so I'm going to confess. One of my favorite things is scones with clotted cream and lemon curd. But even beyond that, my, two of my most favorite things are women in the body of Christ and the Word of God. And when they're together, I just love it. Um, I know some of you, um, there's a lot of familiar faces. Um, some of you I know, some of you I don't know, but here's the thing. In heaven, we're all going to be neighbors, and we're going to have eternity together, so um, we might as well just start now. Um, <laughs> but I always feel like when I meet a sister in Christ, I'm really meeting a sister. And so I hope that uh, this morning that you're all feeling that as you're at your tables that uh, we are all part of the body of Christ, and what a privilege that is. So our theme um, is he has made everything beautiful in his time. And um, I think, as uh, Sarah had alluded to, that it's just not everything that he's making beautiful, but all of us he is making beautiful, and, he's, and we're all in that process. It's such a lovely verse, and it's such a, a fitting for a beautiful day like today. And I say beautiful day like today, outside, maybe not so beautiful, but certainly radiant in here, as Shondell said, the sun is shining. But even with the rain, and we've had a lot of it, and snow, um, we know spring is just around the corner. In fact, uh, as a pastor's wife, I have to tell you all, spring ahead. Tomorrow morning, don't be late for church. Set your clocks. I love this time of year because I like it to be light when I get home from work. I love that. But with all this rain, everything is going to be so green and beautiful and blooming. It's just going to be a stunning spring. I mean, it's going to last for a week, but, you know, and it'll be hot, but it's going to be beautiful. Well, Ecclesiastes 3.11 is where that uh, verse comes from. He has made everything beautiful in its time. But that verse is actually made up of three phrases. That's just the first one. And when we look at it as a whole, we see a much deeper meaning and a beauty that's really transcendent. So if you're familiar with the book of Ecclesiastes, or even if you're not, um, it's not a book we look at a lot, actually. Um, it comes right after Proverbs. Um, it was written by King Solomon, whom God had blessed with abundant wisdom. He, got this, uh, he was the wisest man um, that there was at that time. And Solomon had everything. And I mean literally, that man had everything. He had way too much of everything. Uh, if you, if those laughing know the story. Um, he had 700 wives and 300 concubines, which does not sound like a thing a wise man would do. But he was. The Bible tells us he was very, very wise. But he was also extremely wealthy extremely powerful. He wanted for nothing, but yet he had this dissatisfaction. And in Ecclesiastes, he ponders what is the meaning of life, because it all seems like vanity. And that word vanity means empty. It's a vapor. It's futile until he considers God. And in chapter three, Solomon raises his eyes from the emptiness of man and what's going on here on earth, and he turns his gaze upwards towards God. And his perspective begins to change. And we see that in verse, or, uh, chapter 3, verse 11. So I'm going to read the whole verse, and then we're going to break it down into the three phrases, and then we'll put it back together at the end. So the verse reads in its entirety, He has made everything beautiful in its time, also, he has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. So the first phrase is, he has made everything beautiful in his time. And that's my uh, first point is patiently waiting while God is working. So the really great news is that God is making everything beautiful. And in Hebrew, that word beautiful means beautiful. It's exactly what it means. 
But the maybe not as great news is uh, the timing. Because we can figure out without too much uh, effort that that phrase, in its time, really means in God's time, not in our time. And this may require us to patiently wait. Patience, that's a funny word. We love it and we hate it. (laughs) Culturally, we are impatient. We use words or phrases like instant, microwave, Soundbite, tweet, cliff notes, and then we have emojis because we can't even take the time to, t- to actually text a word. We just pick a picture and say, there you go. If an Amazon delivery takes more than a day, we get very anxious. Yes. We get anxious with others, or excuse me, we get impatient with others. But we want people and God to be patient with us. So I started pondering my own patience level. And um, here's the funny thing. I am a very patient person. And people tell me this. So I believe it. (laughs) Um, When it comes to tedious tasks or small details, um, you know, like that. You open up your jewelry box and you go to pick out a necklace and it's a clump. Okay, I'm your girl. I will untangle that for you. Um, I like fixing little details on embroidery. That's what I do for a living. I am an embroiderer. I have a commercial embroidery store. And sometimes that requires taking out embroidery or detail work. And um, I'm gifted at that. But I also know that I can be very impatient. I've come to realize, I actually made a list of the things that I was patient about and the things I was impatient with, and realized that my patience lies with tasks, and my impatience lies with time. I don't like waiting in lines, at signals, for test results, or if I'm honest, for God to work. But before um, you think impatience is just a problem that we have today, We see in the Old Testament that it was a problem long before technology sped up our lives. So consider the Israelites. Remember those Israelites that Moses freed from Egypt and they're walking around in the desert with him? Well, they thought 40 days was too long to wait for Moses to come back down from the mountain meeting with God. So they made a golden calf to worship. Or Saul, King Saul, who got weary of waiting for the prophet Samuel to arrive to make the sacrifice. So he took matters into his own hands and he disobediently acted as priest. Or Abraham and Sarah, who got tired of waiting for the promised child and they decided they needed to help God out with a surrogate. Well, every one of those things ended in disastrous. And disastrous is a kind word. Uh, results. I mean, really, calamity ensued in all of them. But God's timing still prevailed. It didn't change. Even though they tried to make something happen quicker, God's timing was still God's timing, and that's um, what prevailed. There are numerous verses about waiting patiently for the Lord, and you probably know a lot of them. Um, It's interesting that King David, before he was King David, David, the shepherd boy, David, the man on the run, he wrote a lot of verses about waiting. I think because he had to wait a lot. He was waiting for God to make him king. And so he wrote a lot about waiting in the Psalms. Um, But we also see there was a couple other guys in the Old Testament. Maybe they didn't write about it, but we see their testimony. David, or excuse me, Daniel and Joseph, they waited. They waited a long time to see that God's plans come into action. But a couple of verses are Psalms 27, 14. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And then this one from Lamentations 3, 25, which I love. This is a gem. The Lord is good to those who wait for him 
to the soul who seeks him. The Bible tells us that patience is a fruit of the Spirit. Now, catch that. It's a fruit of the Spirit, not a gift of the Spirit. So that means we all have access to that. We all have. It's fruit of the Spirit. And it also works in our life for sanctification. James uh, chapter 1, verses 2 through 4 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. You always have to stop there and go, are you sure? (laughs) But knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So patience means steadfast, endurance, perseverance. You know, it, it's a word that's like, it, it, it reminds me of going to the gym. You know, you're, it's, you're persevering, you're steadfast, endurance, you're building muscle. And that's how I see that. I like to see things in pictures. It's just how my brain works. But I see patience as the muscle undergirding our faith. It's not a flabby faith. It's a muscular faith because we have patience. We're steadfast. We have endurance. And while we patiently wait, we can be confident that God is working and he's working for our good. So if you find yourself in a place of waiting today, and I'm sure in a room this size with this many women, probably everyone's waiting for something. Um, Some of you may have been waiting a very long time, sometime maybe a short time, but generally there's always something that we're waiting for. But if you find yourself waiting today, remember that you are waiting on the one who made time, who loves you, and who is perfect in all of his ways. It might look like a mess right now, but it won't always be that way. And we're going to see that that's one of the points of this verse, that all of this is temporary. God is making everything beautiful in its time. And that reminded me of Romans 8.28. I know that you ladies from Beaumont are in Romans, and we're in Romans over at Crossway. And so uh, we're a little ahead. We're in 12, so we're past all of the the heavy lifting, and we're we're basking on the mountaintop. But... Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Well, just you get to Romans 8, 29, and it tells us that that purpose is to conform us into the image of Christ Jesus for eternity. And that leads us to the second phrase in this verse. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts. And my second point is expectantly waiting. So if you look up Bible verses, if you're a a Bible geek like me, um, you start to look up words like uh, patience or hope, you will find that they are often linked together with expectation. Because our hope isn't like a, oh, I hope that happens someday. Our hope is a, I know so. It's, we're expectant. We were made in the image of the eternal God, and he has put eternity in our hearts, which gives us this sense of anticipation, a longing for something we can't quite grasp yet. Augustine put it this way, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they can find peace in you. And 17th century thinker Blaise Pascal is attributed to this famous statement. I had to look this up because every evangelist I've ever heard, I think, uses a variation of this quote, but it actually goes back to the 17th century. And he said, There is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of each man which cannot be satisfied by any created thing, but only by God the Creator, made known through Jesus Christ. Well, as born-again Christians, that vacuum has been filled with Jesus Christ. And that anticipation that we had has been replaced with expectation. 
So in Romans 8, going back there because that's where my, uh, my mind kept taking me, because I think these, they're, the two thoughts go together very well. The writer Paul, he talks about the expectation that all creation has for Christ's return. Aren't you ready? <laughs> uh, so verse 19 says, All creation waits eagerly with earnest expectation. And the phrase there in the original language implies standing on tiptoes, straining to see. You know, you might think of a, a, a ship coming back from overseas carrying servicemen and women, and, and their kids are on the dock with the spouse, and, and they're, they're straining to see mom or dad. They want to catch a glimpse. But this is interesting because it says creation. It's not actually talking about people. It's talking about animals, plants, and anything that, that God made. And so I actually think of my cat who likes to stand on two legs and she strains out the window when she hears Bob's car calling in the driveway. <laughs> and she just gets up on two legs and she kind of leans to the window and she's trying to see. And I think, oh, she's looking for Jesus. <laughs> I thought she was looking for Bob, but she's looking for Jesus. But it's that expectation can't wait. Well, he goes on to say that all creation is groaning, including us. We might say amen. Um, but eagerly waiting. And then in verse 25, he adds this. But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. Some translations say perseverance. We're patiently waiting, but we're not passively waiting. And there's a difference. We are waiting with expectation. Jesus said in John 14, verses 1 through 3, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So think of it this way. He has gone to prepare a place for you, and in the meantime, in the waiting, he's preparing you for that place. It's not passive. It's patient, but it's productive. God's making something, not just in heaven, but he's making something in us. While we wait, we pray, we soak in God's word. We engage with, in fellowship with the believers. I would have loved to have been a, a fly on the wall at each of your tables because I'm sure there was conversations going on that were building each other up, encouraging, helping each other out. Um, as women and believers, we can come together and sisters in Christ, man, we need to build each other up and edify each other. The world, you know, it's kind of tearing everything apart and wants to tear us apart, but this is a safe place, and this is a place where we can encourage one another. We also need to serve the Lord, redeem the time. Patient, not passive. We think of time as finite, and I don't know if it's just my age, but I see it now as fleeting. <laughs> I can't believe that you know, it's already, I'm thinking, oh no, I'm going to go into Hobby Lobby next week and there's going to be Christmas decorations back. <laughs> like, oh, it just, time, it flies. And, uh, but it's funny, I, I had a high schooler tell me that recently, that time was flying, and I thought, oh no, <laughs> that's a bad sign. <laughs> if you think time's flying, we are in trouble. Oh. But the Lord is in a different time zone completely. Because he's outside of time. He's not like us. And that brings us to the last phrase, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. So my third point is trust God. Isaiah 55 verses 8 through 9 says, for God speaking, saying, my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, 
so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than yours, your thoughts. So while we wait patiently and expectantly, knowing God is at work, making everything beautiful and using it for our good, we may see glimpses of God at work, but we don't get the whole behind-the-scenes picture, so to speak. There's no backstage interview where God's saying, okay, this is what I'm doing. We don't, we don't know. We don't always see that. We trust God. And, you know, many of us could say Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 from memory. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, him and he will direct your paths. Thank you. <laughs> that went boink, right out. No, we, we trust him. That's part of of walking with the Lord. That's part of the, the element of faith. We don't always have all our questions answered. We don't always see how God's working, but we trust and know that he is. We know he's a God who keeps his promises, that he is holy and righteous and good. We know the Lord who saved us and redeemed us and adopted us and loves us. We can trust him because he's worthy of our trust. So we don't like I said, we may not see how it's going to turn out, but he already knows how it's going to turn out. And because he's outside of time, in his mind, it's already done. It's already worked out. Warren Wearsby summarized Ecclesiastes 3.11 this way. God accomplishes his purposes in his time, but it will not be until we enter eternity that we, be, we begin to comprehend his total plan. I know uh, many of you in this room um, know who Corey Ten Boom uh, was or is. She's in heaven. She's not a was. She's an is. She's just not living here with us anymore. Um, she was a Christian who, along with her immediate family, was imprisoned in a Nazi concentration camp for helping the Jews in Holland. Her family uh, had a compartment in their home, and they hid the Jews um, so they wouldn't be taken to the concentration camps. And um, at one point, her immediate family were all arrested, um, and her uh, father and her sister and others were killed, and she miraculously survived the concentration camp. And she spent the rest of her life telling others about Jesus. And her testimony is filled with examples of God using what was intended for evil, for good, and using things like fleas to bring refuge. As a, her famous story is they had a flea infestation at the concentration camp, and um, she was just bemoaning the fact that all this and fleas too, like seriously. And her sister said, but don't you see the fleas are keeping the guards from coming in? And so we can have Bible study. And uh, they had actually, uh, God had blinded the eyes of the guards and had allowed them to smuggle in a small Bible when they came in. And um, it, just a miraculous things. And, um, but most especially, God gave her his strength to carry on. And he showed her consistently after that how he was making beauty out of those ashes but during Corey's presentations to audiences, she would often hold up the back side of a blue cloth of embroidery with hundreds of tangled threads hanging down from it. And many wondered if she just was holding it backwards. You know, she was getting old. Maybe she just doesn't know she has it backwards. But as she held up the messy side of the embroidery, she would ask, does God always grant us what we ask in prayers? Not always. Sometimes he says no. That's because God knows what we don't know. Look at this piece of embroidery. The wrong side is chaos. But look at the beautiful picture on the other side, the right side. And triumphantly, she would flip the cloth over and reveal an extraordinarily embroidered crown, symbolizing our crown of eternal life. The crown was beautifully stitched with threads of many colors, but also gold, silver, and pearls. 
in our lives, we see the wrong side. But God sees his side all the time. One day, we shall see the embroidery from his side and thank him for every answered prayer and every unanswered prayer. And she would say, close with this, although the threads of my life have often seemed knotted, I know by faith that on the other side of the embroidery, there is a crown. It's just a lovely story. Every time I see uh, uh, embroidery, which is every day, (laughs) I can tell you the backside doesn't look so good, but you can't judge the other side from that. You have to flip it around. And that's what God's working in our lives. From our perspective, it might look like a mess. It might look like knots and, and chaos, like she says. But God sees it from his side. So, uh, sisters, I hope you are encouraged that even when you are waiting, we are waiting for the one who is always right on time. His time. He's not early, unfortunately, or fortunately. I do thank the Lord that he didn't come back before I was saved. And I'm sure that you're all praying for somebody who needs to be saved, and and you're hoping that the Lord holds off one more day. But he's always on time, never early, never late. And he's making beauty out of ashes. He's making it all beautiful once again and for all eternity. And these are wonderful truths and promises that we can hold on to as believers. Especially when we can't see, we hold on to him by faith and we trust the Lord. But trust requires a relationship. Maybe you're here today with us because someone invited you and you don't know Jesus. And this all sounds interesting, but maybe you're like King Solomon. Hopefully not quite like King Solomon. (laughs) But the world has left you empty and you feel that emptiness in your heart. By the time Solomon gets to the book of Ecclesiastes, he has concluded that the only answer to the meaning of life is God. The last two verses of Ecclesiastes, he says this, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. So the good news of the gospel is that God sent his son Jesus to pay the penalty that we owed with his death on the cross and then resurrected from the dead, proving his victory over sin and death, and he ascended into heaven. The cross itself is a picture of God making something so hideous into a beautiful symbol of Jesus' sacrifice for all who would believe. I mean, consider that. It's an instrument of death and it's become a symbol of eternal life. Those who put their trust in Jesus will not face God's judgment, but instead are forgiven, adopted, loved, and will spend eternity in heaven with him, an eternity that we were created for. Romans 10:9 says if you confess with your heart, or excuse me, if you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So this morning, as I, or I guess it's afternoon now, as I close in prayer, I want to invite anyone who wants to know Jesus to pray with me in the privacy of your own heart, your own chair, right where you are. And we're just going to pray. And if if you would like to enter into that prayer, please do. Uh, I I invite you to. I implore you to even. Um, But I also want to speak to um, people maybe who are who are just saved or who are seeking and you have, it seems like you have more questions than answers. I can remember as a brand new believer, I um, had a lot of questions. And so one day I just put my hand on my Bible and this seemed like I could never understand this. Like, how would I ever comprehend this? And I just asked by faith and said, Lord, if this is true, if this is your word, show me. And I can tell you, over the last 30 years, he has done just that. He will answer that prayer. So um, let's pray.
Father, we just lift up these ladies before you. And Lord, if anyone um, is seeking you, would like to be saved, Lord, I pray that they would pray this with me, that, Lord, grant them true faith and true repentance so that they might believe on you and be saved. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve the consequences of my sin. However, I'm trusting in Jesus as my Savior. I believe that his death and resurrection provided for my forgiveness. I trust in Jesus and Jesus alone as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you, Lord, for saving me and forgiving me. And Father, I want to lift up all the ladies here this morning, this afternoon, today. (laughs) Lord, um, you know each and every heart. You know the hearts that are heavy with something that they're waiting for. And Lord, I pray that you would comfort each one. I pray that you would encourage each one. I pray that you would build up each one, that they can trust you and that you are working. And it will be revealed one day. It will be, the beauty will be revealed in us one day. And Lord, we just look forward to that day in eternity. Lord, we just pray a blessing upon all of this time. And and Lord, I do also just pray for those who are just conflicted, maybe, trying to be on the fence. Lord, I pray that that you would work in their hearts and let them know that they can trust you. Lord, we thank you, we praise you, and we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you prayed to accept Christ, I'm going to be the first to say welcome, <laughs> but oh, it's the best. But there's going to be women up here um, that would love to pray with you. Um, if there's something heavy on your heart and you just want prayer, there's, they're going to be up here to pray with you. So take advantage of this time and um, come up and pray with one of the ladies as we um, close in worship. If you're willing and able, let's all stand together for this last song.
with my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Let's sing that again, your goodness. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me with my life laid down I'm surrendered now I give you everything your goodness is running after it's running after me Sing all my life all my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Last time I'd sing So my life you have been faithful You have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I'm gonna sing of the goodness of God We all said, in Jesus' name, amen, amen.